Hi, I'm James Nelson, Vice Chairman at Cushman and Wakefield, and I'm here now for the July 2015 uh, podcast once again with Mike Slattery. Well, good morning good again. Morning. Hello. Nice to see you again. So thank you for uh, telling our audience uh, for the last month's report on the importance of the, the 421A. Um, what I was hoping that I could speak to you today about is landmarks. And um, so maybe you could give our audience a little background on um, why the New York City Landmarks uh, Commission was formed um, and, and the background there. Well, the, the Landmarks uh, Law was enacted in 1965 uh, to preserve the city's architectural, historical, and cultural uh, properties. Uh, and it was a, done in reaction to the demolition of the Penn Station. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it serves a vital and useful purpose in the city of New York so that we can protect those properties and those areas of the city which are most valuable, uh, most historic, uh, and most significant, and distinctively significant. Right. And how much of the city does Landmarks now cover? I mean, you've got historic districts, roughly how many are there? How, how many buildings does this encompass? Well, the, it, it's over 100, I believe it's 120 historic districts, over 30,000 properties. Uh, and what we have seen is we've seen that there's a significant concentration of landmark designated properties, uh, particularly in Manhattan, where Manhattan, where close to 30% of the borough is now designated a landmark. Uh, and primarily through historic district designation. And in some communities, over 70% of those, that community is designated a landmark. And the issues we've raised with that are one, uh, what is the impact of those designations on housing production? Uh, as we talked last time, housing is a critical need for the city of New York. We're not building enough of it. And what we have found is that landmark designation seems to be a deterrent to new housing production and particularly affordable housing production. Uh, and we did a survey looking at new housing development from uh, 2003 to 2012 and found that there were only five new affordable housing units built wow. in the borough of Manhattan uh, over that decade uh, in a historic district or a landmark district. Uh, and so it is, it is, although not intended to be a deterrent for development, uh, it does affect development because of the significant land use regulations that it imposes on property owners. Mm -hmm. I know an, another um, issue uh, that you've been vocal on uh, is with some of these properties being uh, calendared mm -hmm. for landmarks. I mean, some going back to the 1960s or 70s, and they've never come up for a vote. And so, uh, but my understanding is once that they're calendared, you still need to go through landmarks if you want to get approval. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think you, you've proposed having a time limit where either a property is, is landmarked or not. Well, what, just uh, by way of explanation, what, when a property is calendared, it's put under the protective control of the Landmarks Commission so that any uh, changes or alterations uh, that would be proposed for that property has to be reviewed and approved by the Landmarks Commission. Uh, so once it's calendared, it becomes effectively under the regulations of the Landmarks Law. Uh, and the concern that we've had is that properties are calendared uh, and that they are never acted upon, that there is no definitive decision made about whether or not they should be designated or whether they should not be designated. Uh, and we have seen that there were over 3,000 properties in this particular state uh, in the Landmarks uh, there are over 3,000 properties designated and calendared, but not acted upon. Mm. Uh, and some of those properties go back to 1966, you know, when right. landmark law was enacted. So uh, we think that that's really not the uh, proper use of the landmark law. You should make a decision as to if you calendar it, and then you should act on whether it should be designated or not. But you should not keep those properties in this uh, limbo state for 50 years. Right. So as far as the process and just um, owners, investors being able to renovate a property within a historic district, and I know even if you're just doing an interior renovation, you still need to get that certificate of no effect, and if you are doing this something with the facade, mm -hmm. it can take some time to get their approvals before you have to go to the, the building's department. Yep. So um, has Revney been watching kind of the time it takes from start to finish? Because some of the, the retail brokers in particular, who I've been speaking to, have said that you know they have a tenant who comes in uh, to New York City, they want to open up for business, you know, whether it's Soho or one of these uh, historic neighborhoods, 
and then they're, they're really uh, taken back when they find out the, the time it takes to get approval. So do, do you have a sense of kind of the what goes on and, and how we might be able to expedite that process? Well, you hit on a real significant issue, and that is that retail stores in particular really uh, have concerns with landmark designation because as you know retail stores really are the face of this on the street of the business uh, and because it's a face on the street it's a public face and as a public face it now has to be deemed to be appropriate with the landmark in which that store is in and trying to make that store signage uh, its display uh, compatible or appropriate with the building uh, can be a challenge uh, the concern that we've always had is that too many of these districts that are created do not provide any real guidelines to property owners to say what you can and what you cannot do, what you should or you should not do. Uh, we think that guidelines here would be particularly helpful for retail stores so that when someone is going into Soho, for example, they know what the key features are in the Soho Historic District that they need to be sensitive about and so that when they come forward with a sign display or a storefront that they know exactly what would be useful, what would, be, what would work and what could get approval. And that, we think, would make the process go much more, fit, much more quickly uh, and less expensive for the, for the store owners. That's a great point. So for these recommendations for landmarks to run more efficiently, uh, what is Rebney doing about this? How are you uh, addressing the, the issue? Well, we've, uh, there's a couple of issues we've, which we've always been advocating for quite a, quite a few years. Uh, one is clearly to have guidelines uh, in historic district designations. It seems to us that when a district is designated, they know what the key features are that make that district distinctive. Uh, it seems to us that they should certainly put together a list of points that uh, they could share with property owners to say, these are good things to do, these are things that you shouldn't do, uh, to give them some guidance that is specific to their specific location. Because Soho is not the same district you know, as the Upper West Side. Right. So what's appropriate in Soho may not be appropriate on the Upper West Side or vice versa. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second issue is that when you do designate a property, we ask that that property, uh, bef be before designation, once you calendar it, that it move to, in, with some kind of time frame through a process of review and determination, uh, whether that's a year or two years or whatever. But there should be some time frame. We shouldn't take 50 years to keep a property in limbo. Uh, and lastly, we've also said to make it more uh, interesting and more important for the public to know and make it more transparent that designation reports which articulate the reason for the designation and the particular merits of individual properties and how they fit into the district should be given to the public well before they act so that the public can actually review the basis for the designation, can raise questions if, they're, if they own a property in that district, or for organizations like Revney to raise questions about the appropriateness of the designation and whether all the properties that are being proposed should, fit, should be part of that district. Great. Well, we really appreciate all that Revney does uh, on this front, and uh, we look forward to being in touch. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate right, it. Sure Thanks thing. for having me.